What's up everybody, Thralls Metal here once again. I'm the Croc Neck and we are going to go back to some states of metal and I'm gonna go over one that I know has been brought up several times in the comments and wondering when I was gonna to get to this one. Well, today is that day because we are gonna go over some Louisiana sludge metal. In terms of sludge metal in the US, there probably is no greater hub than this state or you could even say NOLA itself. That scene alone has pumped out some absolutely incredible bands, but throughout the state of Louisiana, there is a ton of that awesome sludginess going on and it's kind of wildly different. So I also included some bands that border more on doom metal as well as, you know, a little bit of stoner metal too. But all of it is done with that that grimy, filthy, Louisiana sludge metal style. But first, let's go over what I know about Louisiana. Roughly about 120 years before it even achieved statehood, it was an absolutely gigantic size French territory that stretched all the way up into Canada. Of course, it was named after King Louis XIV because, I mean, his ego was just about as gigantic as the territory itself. So years later, around 1803, the U.S. had been looking to expand territories because we hadn't shoved enough, you know, native people off their land. We needed to do that a little bit more. So we made Napoleon an offer at the time because he was the one that was in charge and we offered him $10 million just for New Orleans because it was such a major port. And Napoleon was like, tell you what, for an extra five million, you can have the whole damn thing. So naturally we were like, yeah, no, sounds like a deal. I mean, it beats fighting you for it because as Americans, we are definitely a very violent people and war was probably inevitable because we would have just said, you know what? Uh, we're just gonna go ahead and take that. Now the state itself did not become a state until 1812. And with its statehood, we naturally had a celebration and we celebrated the most American way possible. Uh, we had a war, lasted about three years and we just called it the War of 1812 or the American Revolution, the sequel, because once again, we were fighting uh, the British again. They didn't like how the first part ended and well, you know, the second part kind of ended about the same. New Orleans itself has been pretty much called a hub of all sorts of different cultures. We have Creole and Cajun, you know, it's a huge melting pot. It's the birthplace of Mardi Gras, the birthplace of jazz. Gambit from the X-Men is from there. It's like the coolest Cajun ever, I think. And speaking of Cajuns, I think uh, the show Swamp People was based out of uh, Louisiana, which was probably the first time I ever watched a show where everyone was probably speaking English, but they had to use subtitles anyway because no one could understand anything anyone was saying, unless you were like Cajun and from there, then you totally got it. I also know that it sits below sea level, which can be problematic, especially during hurricanes. I mean, we found out around Katrina, but it's problematic anyway uh, for different reasons. In terms of interring the dead, they have to build mausoleums because the uh, graves would end up flooding if they buried them and then you would have essentially a flood of corpses, which is a very metal thing when you think about it in terms of just grotesque imagery, but you know, not a good selling point in terms of living there. I can only imagine waking up and seeing a bunch of floaters out in the road after a big rainstorm. That would definitely be something else. And also something that I oddly didn't know, this state has no counties. They have parishes instead, which is essentially the same thing as a county, I believe, just a different name for it. But I didn't know that they didn't refer to counties as counties, they were parishes. So yeah, I actually did learn some actual useful knowledge doing this one. Well, like semi-useful. I don't know when I'm actually gonna use that knowledge unless I'm doing like trivia of some kind and that question comes up. And speaking of further useless knowledge, there's also some very interesting dated laws there. Uh, it is illegal for you to tie your alligator to a fire hydrant. I guess there was a run of people with pet alligators doing that so much so that they had to make a law for it. That just feels like a very exclusively Louisiana thing but maybe like also a Florida thing too, I guess. Another fun one is uh, that taxi drivers are prohibited from making love in the front seat of their cabs during their shifts. I, I guess it's cool if they like, you know, punch the clock and go out in a break and do that, or they can just move it to the back seat. I don't know why they specified the front seat, like the back seats, that's, that's fine. You can just go ahead and do that. Doesn't matter if you're on a busy street, it's just, one more tourist attraction, I guess. So yeah, Louisiana is an interesting place. And 
Well, it's one of my favorite places in terms of metal because it spawned sludge metal. I would say like this is the place where it was born. And it's cool that this place has such a kind of unique form of metal that came out of it and really became a big scene there. So I'm gonna go over a bunch of bands here that you probably know, but maybe some you don't too. But a lot of this is all tied to that sludge scene. Again, I kind of mixed in some doom and stoner in there, but all of them have that kind of Louisiana sludginess to it. So even their approach is different. And what better place to start it than with Crowbar. And this is my personal favorite, Sonic XS at its purest form. This is the seventh album from these NOLA legends. Like this is kind of like the Mount Rushmore of sludge. Uh, this would probably be like the George Washington face, whichever one's the biggest. Now I could have gone with the self-titled. That was the first one that I ever picked up. Or I could have gone with Oddfellows Rest, which is also a personal favorite, but this one's always been kind of my go-to one. Everything that I love about Crowbar is on here. You have these absolutely massive riffs with Kirk's absolutely disgusting tone. Like his guitar tone is honestly up there with one of my favorites out there. It has so much crunch to it, it absolutely hurts. But at the same time, it's still very kind of warm and inviting. And this band's ability to navigate between giant bone crunching riffs and grooves to somber harmonies. God, the guitar harmonies on this album and by extension, pretty much every Crowbar album are always so heartfelt and dreary. And then you have Kirk's kind of raspy crooning and growling on here. This band just personifies almost everything I love about sludge metal. Some of my favorite songs by Crowbar are on here. Uh, Through the Ashes, I'll Watch You Burn, To Build a Mountain, uh, It Pours From Me, Suffering Brings Wisdom. I mean, yeah, everything on here is just melancholy and dark as hell, but man, dude, just riffs and grooves. I love the production on here. Everything is loud, but it's crisp. You get good hardcore D beats that pop up and kind of break up the pace because a lot of this is just very kind of groove laden or just slower in hell. Failure to delay gratification is probably the fastest, most aggressive track in there. Like it almost gets thrashy, but at the same time, you also get some softer, more introspective moments on uh, In Times of Sorrow. It's a little bit more, I don't know, melancholy and, you know, not as heavy as the other tracks. As merciless and gruff and miserable as this album is, it is just very tuneful at the same time. Again, this is like one of those bands where I think I could have pulled just about any album of theirs, and I think most people would go, yeah, no, Crowbar, absolutely awesome. I really don't think this band has a bad album, honestly. But this has always been my personal favorite, and I would say it, it borders on being a perfect sludge metal album. If you've never heard this, jam it, and then immediately go jam the rest of Crowbar because uh, it's just an amazing listen, and if you love riffs, you by extension should love Crowbar, so check it out. Acid Bath, When the Kite String Pops, the legendary debut album from this Homa slash Morgan City band. This is legit swamp metal. And well, they always kind of consider themselves a little bit outside of the NOLA scene because they legit kind of came from the swamp. We actually did a full on retro review of this. Honestly, I think it's one of our most popular retro reviews, but this is, I think one of the wildest albums that ever came out of the whole Louisiana scene because it goes all over the place. It's atmosphere is almost kind of unique going from flat out death metal to sludge metal to like kind of punk and there's even some blues riffs on it, but it is absolutely haunting and unsettling. And a lot of that is due to Dax Riggs vocals, his feral screams and then his like very quivering, strange, clean vocals, which are just insanely catchy. It makes this whole album a very unnerving listen to the point where you don't know where it's gonna go next. And when it comes down to subject matter, man, this band is just flat out dark and weird. Whether the band is going for like more of a straight up kind of rock boogie, like uh, Cassie Eats Cockroaches, or Tranquilize, or the punk hardcore sort of bite of cheap vodka, or even the more like death metal tin songs, like Finger Paintings the Insane, or at least in terms of like the heavier sections on there, there's some big death metal riffs, or Dr. Seuss is Dead, or Jezebel, Man, the whole vibe of this album, it feels like this whole thing was composed by a bunch of mentally deranged people. And I like the fact that it frequently kind of shifts around genres. It never gives you like a moment of like legit comfort because 
something will pop up just to kind of stir the pot of weirdness, like spoken word sections on here and just sort of like twisted guitar effects. Like the whole vibe of this album is just dark and weird and I absolutely love it. I would go as far as to say like this is an absolute gem of 90s metal in general. There really wasn't anything that came out around 94 that I think sounded like this. Like yeah you could say well they pulled some Melvin's influences and a little bit from like Florida death metal and you know some of the groove metal and kind of whirled it up and that would be partially accurate but how it's arranged on here and how it's performed there really isn't anything out there that quite sounds like this album. Even as far as their sludge contemporaries, I don't think there's another band that sounded quite like Acid Bath. Yeah, this is a Stone Cold classic. I think most people know about it in terms of like sludge metal, but if you have not jammed this one, I recommend it. I also recommend Pagan Terrorism Tactics, even though it is a little bit more on the um, like accessible side. Like they were definitely pushing more for hooks and I think that album was a bit more of a musical battlefield. But check that one out too. But this this is the gem. This is the goat in terms of acid bath. Check it out. Jam it. Weird out your friends that haven't heard it before. It's an amazing album. I Hate God. Dope Sick. This is the third album from this absolutely legendary NOLA sludge band. I mean, again, another one that most people know in the scene, but... I gotta bring them up because this band is honestly one of my favorites in the scene just because they're another band that legit no one else sounds like. This band took their love of Melvins to dark, twisted, and uh, I would say depraved levels of just ferocity and anguish and to almost unnerving levels. Like everything about this album feels unapproachable. It's like walking up to a you know, sketchy, snarling dog, and like, yeah, I might be able to get away with like a couple of pets before it mauls me. Well, the dog is this album, and yeah, no, you're probably gonna get rabies. Everything about this album, in terms of the giant sludgy guitars, the big, doomy, bending, lurching riffs, the heavy, droning bass, the odd, off-time drums, which honestly don't come across as a metal drum performance. It's almost more jazzy in terms of the weird start-stop transitions. But the icing on the cake are Mike Nine's vocals. I don't think he performed on this album. I think he survived this album. His screams are agonized as hell. You feel like he is like reliving trauma with every breath he takes to just utter out the most throat shredding screams he possibly can. And his vocal rhythms following the strange off time patterns of the music itself it really gives this uh, album like sort of a fun house effect, like it's kind of off kilter a little bit. This band never wants you comfortable, but this band knows how to bring some riffs. The first song I ever heard by I Hate God was on this album, and it was courtesy of a Century Media comp, and that would be Dixie Whiskey, and that riff is absolutely fantastic. I liked that even compared to other sludge bands, this band kind of brought in a fuzzier tone, like it didn't have like that super hefty crowbar crunch to it. It was a little bit warmer. And I also like the fact that in between all these slow, sludgy songs, they have these violent outbursts of punk and hardcore. Songs like Dog's Holy Life, uh, Non-Conductive Negative Reasoning, Methamphetamine. Probably a true story in there because this band's kind of got a history, at least some of the members do. Peace Through War, then Peace and War. All those songs are great, violent outbursts that kind of contrast the more slow, lumbering and kind of like traumatic listens like ruptured heart theory man that song is just musical agony but it's catchy and it's worth suffering through i guess is the way to put it i like that song i'm not saying it's bad at all but you know it's weird describing this band as anything other than just like the most agonized music that Nola ever put out. Anyway, I absolutely love this album. This might be my favorite I Hate God album. I don't know. It's kind of a tough call. The early stuff is quite good. Like In the Name of Suffering is absolutely fantastic too. But this is where I started. So this is the one I kind of come back to the most. But honestly, you can go through all of I Hate God's entire discography and find nothing but the most traumatic, agonized sludge metal that there possibly is. And as messed up as that sounds, I totally recommend doing it because this band is just absolutely awesome and legit still one of my favorite sludge metal bands out there. So yeah, check this one out and then check out the rest of their stuff because it's awesome. Down, NOLA. This is the legendary debut from this New Orleans supergroup. 
featuring, of course, Phil Anselmo from Pantera, Pepper Keenan from Corrosion Conformity, both Kirk Winstein and Todd Strange from Crowbar, and Jimmy Bauer from I Hate God. And honestly, when I got this, I had no idea who was in this band. I picked it up as a teenager just because I thought the album cover was cool. Or more to the point, the back cover with uh, Jesus smoking a joint. I was like, all right, this is bound to be metal. And as soon as I opened it up and looked at the pictures, I was like, hey, these guys look familiar. And uh, yeah, uh, this became one of my favorite uh, supergroup albums probably of all time. While this does fit in with the sludge metal scene, of course, it is notably more melodic and man, are these songs just flat out catchy. Every single song on here I think is absolutely amazing. The mix of Kirk Wenstein's larger than life riffs coupled with Pepper's, you know, just keen ear for melody because I believe he's doing the majority of all the leads on here and adding to the harmonies that aren't as like downtrodden as they are in Crowbar. They're definitely more tuneful and catchy and man, does this band just have flat out hooks. Honestly, it's one of my favorite vocal performances from Phil Anselmo too. He kind of really embraced the more uh, kind of sludgy crooning on here. And with this band, I think the Southern rock sort of vibe kind of comes through. I mean, you know, Stone the Crow, big single for them. And it is notably kind of a more Southern rock-ish song with a big metal chorus, but man, is that chorus catchy. But this album is packed with tons of heavy moments. Lifer in particular, that is I think one of the best riffs on this entire album. Underneath everything, hooky. I like the kind of like Sabbathy sort of plotting stomp to it. Hail the Leaf, Rehab. I could pretty much name off every song on here because every song has a riff. Even the more somber, reflective, acoustic number, Jail, I think is absolutely fantastic. It's a very introspective, dark, somber tune, but it has just an absolutely beautiful sound to it. It's very spacey and lush. I absolutely love this album. I love most of this band's discography. Like, there's a couple of moments in their discography, like, namely towards the end with the two EPs. I don't think those last two EPs necessarily hit the mark for me, but I come back to this album frequently, and while it doesn't necessarily showcase, like, the absolute ferocity of the sludge scene in NOLA, it captures them at their most accessible, but it does it in a way where it doesn't sacrifice heft. Like, this is still a flat-out heavy album, but maybe in comparison to some of these other albums, especially the big 90s ones in terms of the uh, sludge metal scene, it might not come across as, like, heavy and aggressive as those. They found a good way to be, like, catchy without coming across as poppy, because a lot of the hooks in here are definitely more along the lines, again, of southern rock, blues. It definitely has all of the NOLA flavor in there, but it's not just like the metal side of NOLA, it's kind of the music in general. I would put this on a list of like best debuts ever, best super group debuts ever, I guess we're gonna put like a asterisk by it too. I absolutely love this album, and again, I love this band. I'm kind of eager to see if they do kind of make this full comeback. Kind of curious about that one. We'll see if it happens. I believe the initial plan was to do an album of covers, but that may have changed too, but you know, Phil's kind of busy with the whole Pantera thing right now. And Kirk, I don't think ever leaves the road. I think he's actually out touring right now, or at least by the time of this recording. And who knows, I Hate God might be working on something new too. But yeah, if you have never checked out this album for whatever reason, I strongly recommend it. It is definitely a more melodic side to a lot of this sludgy stuff here, but man, is it damn good. So check it out. Forming the Void, Relic. This is the second album from this Lafayette band. This is I know, kind of a blend of sludge metal, stoner metal, and doom. You could even call it drone because believe me, this band does that. Now I first heard about this band when I saw them live at the Ohio Doomed and Stone Fest, God, back in 2018, 2017, I don't know, 2019. I don't know, it was pre-pandemic. They absolutely blew me away with their performance. I ended up buying all of their albums that were available. I loved their entire set, and I just kind of liked what this band does. It definitely has a very sludgy tone, but at the same time, it's very similar to bands like Monolord, where they frequently drone on riffs. The pace is generally very slow. But I like the fact that they embrace drone and atmosphere in a lot of different senses. Like, it's not just the riffs that drone. It's the vocals, too. 
There are these long, drawn-out vocal harmonies on here where it's almost sort of like a meditative jam behind these giant, droning, heavy riffs, and the whole thing kind of just works in terms of an atmosphere. You kind of get lost in it. This whole blend that they do, I think, could pretty much satisfy any Sludge fan looking for super heavy riffs, or just the Stoner Doom fans that are looking to something to kind of nod out to, because, man, songs like After Earth, uh, the title track, and Unto the Smoke, Man, those songs are just drony, slow, and just dripping with cosmic, spacey atmosphere. The atmosphere and sound of this band, and even, like, to a degree, the lyrics, it doesn't necessarily scream sludge metal in terms of, like, not having that, you know, dark, very, um, God, like, reflective on past trauma sort of vibe that a lot of sludge metal has, like... That's kind of a big thing with sludge metal is like it's very dark in terms of the subject matter because it's very personal. These songs are a little bit more themed around, you know, like fantasy and such and, you know, stuff like that. The song Bialazar, I have no idea what they're talking about, but they're talking about like some winged god or something or other. But I don't know, it's a fantastic song and one of the more upbeat ones in terms of the pace of it. Like the riffs are a little bit more aggressive and... Honestly, like, this is a band you could probably play for someone that likes stuff like Chevelle or Breaking Benjamin. While the hooks aren't quite the same, the fact that there are clean vocals throughout, there are no growls on here, and the fact that this band has a knack for solid melodic hooks could probably at least get their foot in the door in terms of, like, again, a more you know, uh, mainstream listener. I would even occasionally say it has a kind of Tool-like vibe at times. And Tool is kind of noted for the whole, like, syncopated, riffy, but meditative sort of thing. This band kind of does that, but again, closer to a band like Monolord in terms of the big droning riffs. There's also a really cool cover of uh, Led Zeppelin's Cashmere in here, which they stone and drone that thing the fuck out, and Honestly, I really dig it. It is definitely absent of Robert Plant's, you know, more wailing vocals, which he doesn't wail that much on that one. But I kind of like the whole, again, meditative, droney sort of vibe to it. It just becomes this more chill, but, you know, kind of heavy vibe. And that's just the thing I kind of like about stoner metal in general is... It's heavier than hell, but you can totally just relax to it. Anyway, I strongly recommend this band in general. Sadly, it seems as though they are on hold. I actually went over their last one, which I thought was really solid, but this is the one that I frequently come back to, but I would still say all of their albums are good. You get a little bit of uh, production changes from album to album, but overall, it still remains heavy, it still remains atmospheric, and it still remains catchy as hell, so definitely check this one out. Suplex, Mad Oak Red Oo. I think that's how you say that word. Anyway, this is the fourth and most recent offering from this NOLA-based uh, sludge stoner metal act. It's kind of a hybrid of the two. It features one-time I Hate God bassist Danny Nick on vocals and bass on here. And this is probably one of the more like straightforward albums on this list where I think it kind of takes the whole stoner rock formula, but just kind of adds a little bit of like sludgy grittiness to it. It's definitely got a lot of Sabbathy riffs on here, a lot of that southern metal sort of swing to it. There's a lot of bluesy licks being played, and even more of a southern rock sound of the vocals, which are admittedly a little bit hit or miss. When they do hit, they're pretty damn good, and when they're off, uh, well, it doesn't necessarily kill the song, but it doesn't help it. Well, this is definitely a metal album. I would say there's a lot of, like, love of just heavy rock in here. Songs like Stand Alone, Try to Build an Engine. Just flat-out heavy rock riffs and kind of rock hooks to them. But when it slows down and gets a little bit more atmospheric and admittedly a little bit more stony, that's where this band's sound really sticks to me. Trying to build an engine while it starts off more rocking it kind of has like kind of a Caius Fu Manchu vibe like you get a little bit of that high desert rock to it same thing with Stepped On too like it's just kind of got that fuzzy desert rock sort of sound to it but when they get down to their more drawn out kind of just heavy jams like 2x4 and Coward like that's the side that I really like of this band it's that blend of stoner metal and sludge like you still have a lot of heavy riffs that you know, the tone itself while it is fuzzy it's got a good crunch to it and when they decide to lay on those slower riffs that whole vibe really just kind of pours out of the music. 2x4 does have some, what I would call, needless vocals at the end. The whole song could have been a cool instrumental jam, but they just kind of put on, like, one verse at the end, and it was just like, uh, why? But there's also some killer Melvin's Worship songs, like In Your Shadow and Switchblade. Like, they're 
a little bit quirkier. The rhythms are kind of stranger. Like it definitely has like a little bit of that Dale Crover sort of vibe on the drums. Overall, this one's fun because it's an interesting blend of different styles, you know, kind of like Forming the Void, but without the drone and atmosphere, like this one kind of just wants to rock, I think. And then when it does eventually slow down and kind of embrace the more stony side, I think it gets a lot more adventurous. Now, as I said, this was their most recent album and it came out in 2011, so it has been a minute. And uh, as much as the uh, archives say they are active, I don't know exactly how active because I really haven't seen much released after this. I, they might have had an EP, I'm not entirely sure, but uh, this band has been very quiet. Either way though, if you are looking for something that has more of like a upbeat boogie to it, but still has like some cool stony riffs, I don't know, it's kind of a mix of Down and Forming the Void, like you know, the last two I went over. Check this one out, solid listen. I still need to check out more of their stuff in the past, but this was pretty damn good. Thou. Summit. This is the third album from this Baton Rouge sludge doom drone act. I've been a fan of this band for years and this band is hard to keep up with just in terms of the amount of releases. Outside of full lengths they have 13 EPs, 6 collabs, and I think 15 splits. So that's a lot of stuff to keep up with. I got into this band with this album and I'll pretty much say it, if you thought bands like Crowbar and I Hate God had taken you to the most miserable depths that sludge metal could take you, you were only partially right because this band dug even deeper all the way to the bedrock. This album is slow, murky, dissonant, agonized. Comparably, I'd say closer to I Hate God, you still have like little blasty fits every now and then, but for the most part, this is just about this slow, droning, agonized pace. There's not a lot of the jazzy drum flourishes like I Hate God. It's a little bit more straightforward, but man, when it comes down to the riffs and the absolutely tortured vocals on here, this just sounds heavier than everything. Like, not only sonically, but emotionally. I'd say this is like sludge metal plus converge and neurosis sort of mixed in, so you have the just vicious outbursts of Converge and that just massive, layered, dense, miserable sound that Neurosis has pretty much perfected. The whole album moves like a wall of suffocating darkness just slowly inching up on you. The production on here is absolutely amazing. I love how the guitars almost sort of crackle and hiss often. You have strings, organs, there's even some horns that show up on here. And there's even moments of beauty on here, like the song Another World is Inevitable. There's just these beautiful ascending melodies that kind of like pull you out of the darkness for a little bit, only to shove your face right back down in it a few moments later. There's some really good cave-in slash Macedon-esque sort of riffs on voices. I really love the atmosphere on there that has those weird sort of chimey tones that you get with cave-in. And the breakdown on that song is absolutely devastating, but only becomes more devastating when it kind of shifts to that more somber vibe towards the end. Like it goes from brutal to just oppressively dark. And man, does this band excel at that. Even in its quieter, more subdued sections, like the bridge on Grissicon, which is just particularly haunting, it still feels like the song is surrounding you and just sort of squeezing you with all of its just dark, menacing, borderline traumatic vibes. Like this whole album feels like someone going through the worst possible moment of their life. And again, those moments where it kind of brings you out of it just for a second only to bring you crashing back down to reality. Those are the ones that I think hit the most. I absolutely love this album. It is probably like the closest thing to, I would say like Funeral Doom and Sledge kind of coming together because it just has that vibe, especially on uh, Another World is Inevitable. That song, I guess you could call it Funeral Sludge. It is a flat out dirge. Again, with brighter moments, but a dirge nonetheless. I need to get more by this band. Uh, I only own one other album, but again, they have so many different collabs and EPs. It's kind of hard to like get all of their stuff, and I don't know how much of it is actually on CD, because I know this band puts out a lot of stuff on vinyl, and more than likely tape, because tapes are a thing again. But I know this album cemented me as a fan, and it is fantastic from start to finish. Again, if you love I Hate God and Crowbar, but also, you know, Neurosis, 
kind of that post metal sort of vibe, but it's like the darkest post metal imaginable. Check this out then. This is an absolutely amazing album from start to finish. And yeah, I need to get more of that on my collection. And maybe so do you. So start here. Soylent Green, a deleted symphony for the beaten down. This is the third album from this NOLA sludge slash death grind act. I know it's like kind of a weird mix, but uh, this band does it well, and I don't think any other band really does it. So, yeah, I think they're kind of like the forerunners of Death Grind Sludge. So much like Acid Bath, this band is sort of an oddity in the sludge scene. And uh, this band also features, of course, Ben from Goat Whore, which that also features Sammy from Acid Bath. And this also features Tommy Buckley, who is the current drummer of Crowbar as well. So there's a lot of uh, mixing within the NOLA scene here. Now I got into this band with String of Lies, but this is the one that's always been the one I came back to just because I think it's their most dynamic release. Like you get that really, you know, weird sort of balance between just ferocious grindcore and like kind of I hate God style sludge metal. When they go into their sludgy vein, it's kind of all over the place rhythmically. It's weird, it's kind of like tormented sounding. And then from there, it'll go into these just grindcore fits of rage and just some of the most explosive songs, I would say, in the entire sludge metal scene because this is one of the few sludge metal bands that really like to use blast beats. And Tommy Buckley's drum work on here is fantastic. Like it's somewhere between like, you know, the more groove laden stuff you'd hear from like Jimmy Bauer from I Hate God, but also like Discordance Access, like the more technical side of grind because this band would constantly shift. Like there's a lot of really interesting tempo shifts and riff changes and even some death metal elements. Uh, songs like Swallow Hole, Clockwork of Innocence has a flat out slam breakdown on it. Like they kind of just pull a little bit from like suffocation just for that song. And uh, the last track, She Cheated on You Twice. Man, bummer, dude. But those songs are a good contrast from the more like just straightforward sludge songs in here, like An Addict's Lover, uh, let's see, Last One in the Noose, and one of my personal favorites, uh, Later Days. I like the clean intro of that. It's very muffled and quiet, and then the song just explodes into some of the catchiest riffs in the entire album. And honestly, the thing that kind of weaves us all together are Ben's crazy vocals. Going from high shrieks to low growls, his cadences constantly flipping from like right on the nose, just like kind of like, you know, sticking to the rhythm to ranting and raving like a lunatic. It's very similar to I Hate God, but it kind of comes together a little bit more in terms of like more traditional riff patterns and grooves to kind of bang your head to. I would say like out of all of these I've gone over, this one kind of packs that same level of like kind of like death metal brutality almost consistently across this album. And it kind of makes it stand out and by that like the band standing out. Now this band has been kind of quiet for a number of years, though they said they were still active or at least on hold for a while. They have resurfaced this year. They are playing at MDF and believe me, I am excited as hell because uh, I absolutely love this band. They are, again, kind of an oddity in the sledge scene just because of their love of grindcore and death metal and how much that's infused in here. Like Acid Bath definitely has death metal moments on it, but it's not the overall sound. Their overall sound is acid bath. I mean, that's the best way to really describe it. But this band is consistently vicious, like a grindcore band almost across their entire discography. If you have never jammed this band, this might be where I would start. Uh, I think this is kind of baseline, like one of their most well-rounded albums, and it actually has a lot of good hooky riffs on it. But I think across the board, you're going to find that on any of their albums. But I'll also say if you're a grindcore fan and you never considered checking out this band because you thought they were just more of a straight up sludge band, Check this band out. This will satisfy the itch for grindcore fans as well as sludge fans. And uh, yeah, I recommend pretty much their entire discography and I am absolutely stoked to see them in MDF this year. So yeah, check it out. Outlaw Order, Dragging Down the Enforcer. This is the debut full length from this NOLA sludge metal super group. Features members of I Hate God, St. Vitus, and Soiling Green, which is why I brought up Soiling Green first. Now this one I picked up on a whim. That and it came in this really cool steel case. I just thought that was interesting. And uh, I had no idea who was in it. And then almost as soon as I heard the vocals, I was like, that's Mike Nine from I Hate God. There's no way it's not. And it was right. 
Now, this band, I believe, kind of formed during like a hiatus for I Hate God. Mike was looking for another musical outlet. And so he came together with these other gentlemen under <laughs> kind of interesting circumstances because the name is a reference to the fact that almost every member of the band was in legal trouble around the formation of this band. Which honestly, I wasn't surprised by, especially knowing Mike's history with the law. He's doing much better now, but yeah, he's had a rough go in a lot of different ways in the past. Anyway, sonically overall, this is almost like the halfway step between Soylent Green and I Hate God. You have all the tropes of I Hate God with the more like off time, slow, sludgy rhythms. Mike's again, just absolutely tortured, anguished vocals. But on the other side, you have a little bit more of that like fast kind of almost grindy sound that Soylent Green has. I will say it's not as grindy as Soylent Green, like this doesn't have like a ton of blasts, but that more aggressive nature is there. And it's not quite as anguished and tortured as I Hate God. In fact, you don't get a lot of those like big droning sections where Mike is just ranting and sounding like he's crawling on the floor, just, you know, doing his best to have to throw up blood on the mic. But there's this big kind of like hardcore slash punk element that really pushes through in here, especially on songs like Relive the Crime, uh, Siege Mentality, Mercy Shot, and Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. That's pretty much how they party down there, I'm pretty sure of it. There's really good drum and bass buildups on Safety Off and Double Barrel Souls Everything. And as much as the song title scream don't mess with me, I'll hurt you. Uh, honestly, it's decidedly more approachable than I would say Soiling Green or I Hate God. There's more like flat out catchy riffs on here and just straightforward grooves, but it's just done in a just sort of punky, vicious, snarly manner. Like there's some flat out like really catchy riffs that open up ATF. You know, it's kind of like blues rock for a second before it goes into like a punky fit. And I would say this is like less dark than I Hate God. Like honestly, it's more pissed off than anything else. Like it's not like, again, going through past traumas and you know, uh, recounting them. This is pretty much just, I am unbelievably pissed about this thing and I gotta go talk to my parole officer here in a little bit. So, you know, I'm not in a good mood. Yeah, I dig this album. It's really short, I will say that. Like it's less than 30 minutes, but it is vicious pretty much from start to finish, even though the outro is a little bit weird. But yeah, I mean, if you're a big fan of I Hate God and Soiling Green and you just want to hear just angrier than shit sludge metal like this is definitely the one to check out and if you do find this see if you can find the steel edition i don't know if they did another edition of this but i've, I've always liked this one just because i don't have a lot of these steel book ones it's just sort of fun packaging but yeah this is more than just fun packaging this is just nasty sludge metal so check it out worms slake this is the debut album from this baton rouge uh, sludge metal, I don't know, kind of Melvin's worship band. I bought this as a blind buy years ago and uh, pretty much my buddy said, yeah, uh, they said if you liked Melvin's, you'd probably like this. Like that was the big promo hook for it. And I was like, well, I do like Melvin's. So I'm just gonna go ahead and check this out. And yeah, no, it, it definitely sounds like Melvin's. In fact, this is probably the most Melvin sounding one on the list. I will say it's a little bit more dark and ominous than the Melvin's. Like the Melvin's kind of came across as like just strange. Like they have their own sort of vibe. These guys have, were kind of pulling in a darker direction. The opening track, Corpse Corpse, <laughs> which they just spelled corpse like in Dead Buddy and then corpse or core, whatever. Um, uh, it starts off with Gregorian chants and like Middle Eastern music sort of creating this ominous atmosphere. And then when the music does kick in, like it sounds very Melvin's esque, like right down the vocals, he has sort of a buzz o sort of vibe. And when it comes down to song titles, yeah, there's definitely some Melvin's vibes just because they're kind of weird. I mean, you know, right after Corpse Corpse, you have uh, Find a Meal, Find a Bed, Find a God. Uh, then you have <laughs> Vinny, Vitty, Fuck. <laughs> Does really work with the, you know, V scheme there. Stiff upper lisp. Uh, you're in trouble now, as in like you're in. Our Lady of Perpetually Shit Faced. Yeah, uh, they clearly had a lot of fun with this. You get these weird shifts in the songs of like big droning guitars and these long sustained groans. It gets, you know, doomy and ominous, then all of a sudden it kind of breaks out in these weird off time, just chuggy riff patterns and bizarre fucking drums. Again, very Melvin's-esque, but 
you know, not like I hate God's version of Melvin's worship. Like this is clearly their own. And there's a lot of shifts to like more acoustic material in the songs too. Like they'll go to like some more somber break and play like, you know, just clean acoustic melodies before erupting into more sludge riffs. So you get this really cool dynamic and I like these little brief pauses to sort of catch your breath and try to figure out what the hell they're gonna do next. The other thing that really contributes to the atmosphere are just the use of frequently just strange samples. Mouth is a wound and Our Lady perpetually shit-faced. Man, there's just some messed up shit in there. I think they like just sampled some tweakers they ran into or something like that because uh, yeah, just kind of adds the unnerving weird atmosphere in here. Now I think this album kind of descends into weirdness a little bit too far toward the end. The songs become more unhinged and more twisted and a little bit less catchy. The song Feed the Hand That Bites You is just a really odd sort of you know, almost kind of like Sleepy Time Gorilla-esque sort of song. Like, it's just put together very strangely. The atmosphere sort of takes over. It, like, descends into madness. That's just kind of the best way I could describe that song. Either that or, like, Macabre did a sludge metal song. Like, that's the other way I could describe that one. But overall, I really like this one. This is just flat out weird and dark. It doesn't feel, like, traumatic. It just feels like an interesting little look into a lunatic's brain. It just has its own unique vibe even though it definitely sounds like a Melvin's worship band because I mean I, I really think they probably are. Now I haven't heard any of their other stuff I definitely want to find more but if you're big on Melvin's worship and just like Melvin style you know riffing and song structure definitely check this band out. This album is kind of weird towards the end but for the most part it's a solid banger and uh, I definitely want to find more of their stuff so check them out. Sour Vein, Ghetto Angel. This is the third EP from this uh, band that's kind of from all over. They have one member from NOLA, so I'm going to count it, and it is 100% sludge metal, so that's the other reason I'm going to count it. But this band actually has members from New York, North Carolina, California, and Texas, so yeah, kind of all over the place. But it does feature members from bands like Gates of Slumber, Buzz Oven and Weed Eater, and that one member from Buzz Oven and Weed Eater is none other than Dixie. So that's a lot of sludge cred, at least in my book. Now, this is the first thing I ever picked up by this band. Now, admittedly, I had kind of forgotten about this band for years up until, I would say, like last year. I got one of their albums when I was down in Florida, and I was like, oh yeah, I totally remember this band, and they're still pretty good. It's just straightforward, ugly sludge metal, lots of doomy droning riffs, and because Dixie is on this album, that means the bass is ungodly loud. And I mean, he wouldn't have it another way. And honestly, that's kind of what I expected. And it works. It kind of fills out this gross, grimy sound of just riffs and groove and absolute misery. It's a very straightforward, gritty EP with bits of stoner doom mixed in. You do have some creepy additional atmosphere worked in on songs like Doldrums. And the last track, the wonderful uh, acronym Dilligaf, which stands for Do I Look Like I Give a Fuck, which I think that's pretty hilarious and honestly speaks volumes of the attitude of at least, well, Dixie Collins for sure. It's a very short release, but all four tracks pack a nasty punch. The production on it is particularly heavy. I mean, of course, you know, a lot of low end on it. It's thick, it's murky, the vocals are predominantly snarled and screamed and there's like this kind of like broken intercom sort of static on them occasionally that adds to the more unsettling nature of it. The guitars sound very overdriven, they crackle and snarl and overall it's just got a good straightforward sort of sludge metal approach. It's not really reinventing the wheel but it's perfectly fine just doing what it does because it just has that sludge metal vibe and that's generally the thing I look for. Like, I want those big, lurching, disgusting riffs. And of course, when I find out, like, Dixie's on it, I want to hear that massive bass just absolutely dominate almost everything. The full-length album that I picked up, Black Fangs, definitely has a lot more to it, or at least just more songs to it because it's a longer offering. But I think this one kind of just captures, like, an almost sort of jammed in studio vibe and overall it's just dark and creepy and yeah i'm always down for dark and creepy sludge metal but uh if you're a fan of i would say like crowbar on this one specifically and definitely some buzz oven like it definitely has their sort of like creepier more 
uh, deranged sound. Not just because Dixie's on it, but having Dixie on here definitely does help with that. Check this out. Gnarly Listen, and I recommend the full length two Black Fangs. I think that one's pretty solid as well. And finally, we have Kingdom of Sorrow, their self-titled debut. And for those that don't know, this was the fun collaboration between one Kirk Winstein and one Jamie Josta of Hatebreed. And when I got this, I saw this as a marriage of two things that I really love because I love Crowbar and I'm still a big Hatebreed fan. And honestly, it kind of runs yeah, about like that. Like, I mean, honestly, we know who's writing the riffs. Every song in here has just an absolutely nasty riff to it because it's Kirk. And for the most part, I would say this does kind of just sound like Crowbar, albeit with like some different vocals every now and then because Kirk is also doing vocals as well as Jamie. But it's those moments where you get like more of those syncopated chugs, like either a little bit more on the metal core side and then kind of going into the heavy, slow, sort of doomy songs you kind of get a little bit of a balance of both of their sides. Overall, it crafts like a really cool balance though. You get like the big dreary kind of crowbar hooks and songs like Grieve a Lifetime with unspoken words screaming into the sky. All those songs have those deep melancholic harmonies, the, you know, the stuff that you just come to expect from Kirk. But it's the songs that kind of balance it out in terms of both of their sides of metal that I really dig. Like, piece it all back together. The opening of that song is doom laden. It sounds defeated and downtrodden right from the rip, but as it goes on, it picks up the pace. It gets a little bit more of that hardcore metalcore infusion. It gets faster and more aggressive. And that is one of the things I really like in terms of the meeting of both of these minds. Like, both of them love riffs. They love heavy music. They like groove. That's in both camps, both Crowbar and Hatebreed. But in terms of lyrics, they are diametrically opposed. Kirk likes to talk about like the most morose and depressing and just dark of subject matters. Like that is kind of like one of the core things about Crowbar. It's just immensely depressing in terms of the lyrics. Whereas Jamie is all about like stand up, fight, you know, you can do better, be the best person you possibly can. He's just yelling like fucking daily affirmations at his audience. And honestly, I love him for it. Like that's just like one of the cool things about Jamie Jossa in terms of his lyrical approach. Like he wants to motivate people. So you get this really interesting like uh, contrast in terms of styles. Like you have the absolutely morose and depressing music and riffs colliding sometimes with the more upbeat sort of just like let's just take on this thing and take it on violently nature that is 100 percent